I am David Cohen from the Cardiovascular Research Institute in New York and St. Francis Hospital. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, uh, very interesting and uh, uh, diverse session on issues in pharmacology and PCI. Uh, we will have a total of six different uh, lectures this morning, separated into two sections, uh, um, with the panel discussion after the first three and after the last three uh, lectures. Uh, my co-moderator is Dr. Uh, D.W. Park, who everyone knows from uh, Seoul, Korea. Uh, we have an excellent panel uh, this morning. We have uh, Dr. Akko, uh, Dr. Chen from uh, Beijing, China, Dr. Han, Dr. K.W. Park, uh, and Dr. Schupke from Germany. Uh, so we are uh, really thrilled to have everyone here and the uh, session has really some terrific uh, lectures and some terrific topics in an area that uh, continues uh, to develop more and more evidence, but in some ways be, uh, uh, become increasingly confusing as we have more options. Uh, so with that as an introduction, I want to uh, bring on our first speaker. This is uh, uh, Dr. Dominic Angelillo from the University of Florida, uh, and he's going to be speaking about guided versus potent P2Y12 inhibitor and updated evidence. Dominic. Thank you, uh, David, for the kind introduction and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to be together in person uh, next year. Um, so over the next 12 minutes, uh, I've been asked to speak about the topic of guided versus potent. Uh, P2Y12 inhibitor therapy uh, updated evidence. Uh, these are my... So let's speak a little bit about the topic of uh, why uh, considering a guided approach. And our starting point is really an understanding of what happens with the potent P2Y12 inhibitors. As you see here, the results of the uh, Triton trial with Prasergel and the Plato trial with Ticagalor, uh, both uh, confirming that the use of a potent P2Y12 inhibitor in, in the setting of ACS is associated with a greater reduction of ischemic events compared to a clotidogram. However, this also comes at the expense, uh, as you can see here, of an increased risk of bleeding, risk of bleeding which increases uh, over time. The other thing that we have learned is that the uh, benefit uh, of the more potent P2Y12 inhibitors is mostly uh, front-loaded. Uh, now, uh, if we parallel this concept with the concept that, yes, we know that uh, these agents are better than clopidogrel because clopidogrel in a significant number of patients uh, is not achieving the full antiplatelet effects. And more specifically, we know that patients with high platelet reactivity are at increased risk of ischemic events. However, we do have a significant number of patients who do respond well to clopidogrel and who do have good uh, outcomes. And so if one were to say uh, uh, what would be the number needed to treat with the potent agents within this range of PRU of patients treated with clopidogrel, we would say this number would be very, very high. So uh, this is obviously sets the rationale for the concept of a guided approach. In other words, uh, consider clopidogrel in those patients who respond well to the drug and the more potent agents in, in those who do not. And here are the foundations for the concept of personalized medicine uh, in which uh, by using pharmacodynamic uh, and platelet function uh, and genetic testing approaches, that we can consider uh, tailoring uh, treatments. Now, this concept uh, uh, started over a, a decade ago. Some of you may recall these uh, historical trials, including uh, Gravitas, Trigger PCI, uh, Arctic. And you all may recall that uh, uh, despite the excitement surrounding these trials, uh, they were found to be uh, uh, negative uh, studies. And somewhat uh, of a disappointment, obviously, because one said, well, does this concept of tailoring therapy, uh, uh, should we still move forward with it? Is it game over? And I think that uh, like many uh, trials that we uh, conduct in the early phase, one needs to be uh, objective and understand the limitations 
of uh, of these trials. And here you see the pros and cons of the different uh, of the different trials. But there's a common denominator here, which you see over here, the patient population. And one of the things that uh, obviously we all know is that if you have the wrong patient population in which you're testing a strategy, it becomes very very difficult to see a treatment effect. Other limitations as well, but I believe that this is the most important one because essentially these were uh, studies with very, very low risk patients. So the other uh, aspect is what you see highlighted on this cartoon is uh, based on what we've learned from these original uh, uh, trials that you see here, where the approach was essentially to look at patients and uh, do testing on them, and only if they're non-responders, randomize them. So it's not really looking at testing as a strategy. And this is what has changed in more recent trials, which you see uh, highlighted over here, um, where the uh, systematic guided approach with either genetic or platelet function testing allows you to distinguish uh, patients with, uh, with different response and also define whether you're using a treatment of escalation or de-escalation. They're very, very different uh, concepts with very, very different objectives. And you see here, the, uh, uh, the concept of a de-escalation would be typical of a patient presenting with an acute coronary syndrome where the default strategy would be prasugrel or ticagrelor. And if they are uh, being uh, tested, okay, and being a non-responder, uh, then they should be treated with the strategy instead if they are a responder, uh, they would be maintained on clopidogrel. So the objective here would be with this approach of de-escalation to reduce bleeding while preserving uh, without any trade-off in ischemic events. On the other hand, if your starting approach is that, for example, a patient with chronic coronary syndrome where the default strategy is clopidogrel, well, if you are using a guided approach if the patient is a responder, they stay on clopidogrel, and if they're non-responder, they escalate with the objective of reducing ischemic events and hoping on not having a trade-off in, in bleeding. And so this has been the new mindset of using a guided uh, approach. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of differences between platelet function and genetic testing. Uh, there's going to be a subsequent talk. Obviously, everybody has their own uh, opinion, as we've heard from other uh, sessions. But when we look at the studies, and this is a meta-analysis that we published in The Lancet not too long ago with 20,000 patients, you can clearly see that when you consider the approach of a guided escalation, you do reduce ischemic events with a reduction in death, MI, and stent thrombosis and stroke without any trade-off in bleeding. And on the other hand, when you use a guided de-escalation, we reduce bleeding without any trade-off in ischemic events. And again, this is a meta-analysis study level with its limitations. Uh, we know that the trials overall have been small so far and thus not powered uh, uh, individually for heart ischemic events. Now, after the publication of our Lancet paper, we decided to think, bring things to the next level and conduct a network meta-analysis uh, in uh, patients with an acute coronary syndrome uh, to uh, more specifically address uh, the comparative effects of a guided approach versus potent P2Y12 inhibitors uh, over 61,000 patients from 15 randomized trials. This was just released a few weeks ago in the European Heart Journal, where we have as a reference uh, treatment uh, clopidogrel, and then we have uh, the guided approach, the uh, use of ticagrelor and, and prasugrel. And this is essentially what we uh, observed. This is kind of a busy cartoon, uh, but I'll go to a, uh, an easier to interpret uh, a slide. But essentially the strategy uh, of a guided approach was the one that reduced MACE to the greatest extent compared to the reference, which is clopidogrel. Uh, you do have a reduction in MACE with prasugrel, not much of an effect with ticagrelor. Uh, this is mainly driven by a reduction in MI uh, and reduction in stent thrombosis. And on the other hand, we have the most favorable bleeding profile with the guided approach. Um, I think this cartoon really summarizes it all. And I'm gonna walk you through this. This essentially shows the data that I just presented in the prior slide when it comes to MACE and all bleeding. Uh, but when we do a ranking of treatments using a P-score, 
uh, uh, where the uh, a score of one is optimal, you can see that with a clopidogrel, uh, obviously it's the best uh, drug when it comes to bleeding, obviously it's the least potent drug, so you have a score uh, closer to one, uh, but definitely not the best approach when it comes to prevention of MACE or ischemic events here you see in the green dots. When you go across the different strategies, Ticago, or Prasser, and the guided approach, you can see that the guided approach is the one that has the two dots, one for MACE and one for all bleeding, closest to a, a one, and definitely better than the uh, uh, approaches of Ticagrel or a Prasigrel alone. So definitely very, very informative analysis, clearly showing that the guided approach is the one with the best, the best uh, 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 trade-off in both safety and, and, and efficacy. Can we do better? Well, uh, the answer is absolutely. We can do better. Uh, we can look at uh, integrated approaches of using genetic testing with clinical risk factors. This is a score that we came up with. It's called ABCD gene score, uh, which has been validated in a number retrospective, uh, uh, retrospectively in a number of studies. Uh, it was a score designed to identify patients with high platelet reactivity. Uh, we do not have, however, uh, prospective studies using this score yet. Uh, so when we take it and put it all together, the concept of a guided approach, my opinion is not just based on drug response uh, using platelet function or genetic testing. I do believe that we still need to integrate this with clinical variables, as mentioned before, and also a number of procedural uh, uh, risk factors. And this all together truly represents the concept of a guided or personalized approach. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dominic. Uh, it's a really nice uh, review and uh, lots, to, uh, lots to think about. Uh, we will now go on to the second lecture in the series. Uh, this will be given uh, uh, virtually by uh, uh, Dr. Tullio Palmarini uh, from Italy uh, on speaking on specific tools for guided antithrombotic strategy, uh, genotyping, platelet function, and other tests. Dr. Palmarini. Uh, this is uh, the reason uh, why we need uh, guided antithrombotic therapy. Clopidogrel is uh, a prodrug, 85% of which is uh, hydrolyzed uh, by esterase and therefore is, it is inactivated, and the other 15% uh, has uh, to undergo a two-step oxidative uh, process uh, in which uh, many enzymes uh, are involved. This is the reason why there is a high variability to clopidogrel responsiveness and the percentage as I said, 30% of patients may be poor responders to clopidogrel. We can measure uh, platelet responsiveness uh, to clopidogrel using platelet function testing or genetic testing. There are many platelet function assay, but uh, the one which have received the most uh, extensive investigation are Verify Now and VASPAS, and we will concentrate on uh, that. So Verify Now P2Y12 test is a whole blood point of care assay. It, is, uh, it gives a rapid and reproducible result without any blood uh, handling. It is a light transmission-based optical detection assay, which measures adenosine diphosphate-induced platelet aggregation, and it uses disposable single-use cartridge containing fibrinogen-coated bits and platelet activators. So the uh, test, the assay comes in two, three versions, the Verify uh, Now Aspirin test, the Verify Now 2B3 test, and we will concentrate uh, for our proposal Verify Now PRU test. So this is uh, the machine and this is the cartridges. The uh, uh, tool is uh, very simple. A sample of whole blood is inserted in the cartridges and then the cartridges is inserted in the uh, machine and results will be provided uh, in a few minutes. This is the principle on uh, how uh, this uh, system works. There is a light source uh, mixing cartridges uh, with the sample and the light detectors. Then uh, uh, in the cartridges, uh, the uh, fibrinogen coated beads and platelet activators will activate uh, platelets, uh, which will uh, precipitate, uh, letting uh, the light uh, go through the sample and reach the detector. But now if there is an uh, 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 inhibitor of platelet activation, uh, there, will, uh, no, uh, there will no aggregates formation and therefore the uh, light transmission will be hindered. And this is the principle of the system. 
Um, so ITP has two receptors, the P2Y12 uh, receptor and the P2Y1 receptor. Uh, clopidogrel binds uh, to just one receptor. And to make uh, the test uh, more uh, specific for clopidogrel responsiveness, the cartridge contains also PGE1, which is an inhibitor of P2Y1 receptor. The result is given in uh, platelet reaction uh, units. And uh, we talk about uh, high platelet reactivity when the uh, PRU are higher than 208, or in some studies, uh, the cutoff used, uh, uh, the cutoff use was uh, 230. So the VERIFY NOW has been investigated in the ADAPTES uh, study in which uh, 11 centers with more than 8,000 patients uh, underwent successful drug stent implantation. And you can see that uh, patients who had the true value higher than 200 and hated an increased risk of uh, stent thrombosis and an increased risk of myocardial infarction. The VASP assay is a different assay, uh, which has the advantage over the VERIFY now that it is not affected by glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitors. And this is an advantage that could be more relevant a few years ago when there was uh, a broader use of glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitors. So VASP is an intracellular protein which is involved in the cascade of uh, platelet activation. PGE uh, one uh, cause a phosphorylation of VASP protein, which is a signal of resting or inhibited platelets, uh, whereas ADP cause dephosphorylation of the protein. Now in the test, uh, we give uh, both PGE1 and ADP. So we will have uh, some uh, phosphorylation due to PGE1 and dephosphorylation uh, to, due to ADP1 addiction. But now if we block the uh, ADP receptor with clopidogrel, now the um, proportion of phosphorylation would be higher. And this is the principle of the test, which measure platelet reactivity uh, index as a difference between fluorescence intensity with PGE1 minus fluorescence intensity with the combination of PGE1 plus ADP uh, over forest intensity with PGE1. And we talk uh, about high platelet reactivity when the platelet reactivity index is more than 50%. So this test was validated in the uh, GPRES studies, uh, which is a study with more than 1,000 patients uh, with acute coronary syndromes undergoing drug glutis stent implantation. As many patients was on glycoprotein 2B3A, we use the platelet reactivity index measured with the VASP assay. We see, and you can see that those patients who had the platelet reactivity index more than 50% had an increased risk of uh, an increased rates of ischemic events as compared to those who were uh, good responders uh, to uh, clopidogrel. But what about uh, genotyping? You see that. Uh, from uh, clopidogrel administration to uh, the formation of the active metabolite, uh, there are many uh, steps in which many uh, enzymes uh, are involved. Um, uh, most of uh, the uh, uh, genes involved in this uh, complex uh, metabolic pathway are those of the CYP2 family, but there are also other genes of different family like ABCB1, which is involved in clopidogrel absorption, POM1 and CES1. So um, among these uh, uh, many uh, candidates, uh, um, the one which has received the most extensive va uh, validation as a ge genetic determinant of poor, of poor clopidogrel responsiveness is the CYP2C19 gene. So the other gene of the uh, CYP family, as well as a BCB1, POM1, SS1, have been suggested in uh, some studies as uh, possible mediators of poor responsiveness to clopidogrel, but these findings have not been confirmed in other studies. So CYP2C19 genes come as a highly polymorphic gene with more than 35 star allele haplotypes. So we have uh, summarized in this slide uh, the most frequent of them. The wild type is uh, star one. Then uh, we have uh, some loss of function alleles uh, from star two to star eight and over, which confer no enzymatic activity like star two and star three or reduced enzymatic activity like star nine and star 10. Then we have uh, incre increased uh, function allele, which produce increased enzymatic activity like uh, star 17. The most frequent loss of function allele is, by the way, star two and then uh, star three. 
So the combination of uh, these uh, uh, haplotypes uh, provides uh, and determines uh, uh, different uh, uh, phenotypes, such that we can have, uh, we can have uh, ultra rapid or rapid metabolizer if uh, we have uh, uh, homozygous for star 17 or heterozygous with star 1 and star 17, respectively. Then we can have uh, normal metabolizer or who are homozygous for star 1, and uh, uh, we can have then intermediate metabolizer metabolizer or poor metabolizer, depending on whether these uh, uh, subjects are homozygous for star 2 or star 3 or heterozygous with the low, one loss of function allele and, and one wild type allele. So uh, genotyping can be achieved very quickly with modern technology. Here I summarize some available tests. You can find the whole list of tests uh, through internet in this email. Most of these tests are based on a Buka swap, and you have result in a one hour or just few hours. Of course, uh, to uh, provide uh, that uh, genotyping is uh, relevant from a clinical point of view, we have uh, to uh, provide an association between uh, genotyping, uh, platelet function density, and uh, uh, clinical outcome. Like uh, it was done in this study, in which uh, genotyping was performed in 162 healthy subjects, and uh, uh, C2C19 was associated with reduced pharmacokinetic response and reduced pharmacokinetic Called dynamic response to clopidogrel. Then uh, patients in the Triton trial were stratified according to the presence of at least one uh, CP2C19 allele. And you can see that carriers had the significantly higher rates of events as compared to non carriers. But uh, an important point that should be stressed and that uh, the population uh, in which uh, you study is very important uh, as in other setting like uh, in primary prevention trial like charisma trial or atrial fibrillation trial like uh, the active trial, there could be no correspondence, no association between uh, ischemic outcomes and the presence of at least one or loss of functionality. So, the population in which uh, you implement the test is very, very important. And uh, like they did in this meta-analysis with the nine studies and almost 10,000 patients, 91% underwent PCI, 54% had acute coronary syndromes. And you can see that uh, patient uh, who had at least uh, uh, one uh, uh, loss of function allele had increased risk of ischemic events. So uh, population in which this uh, uh, genotyping seems uh, to work uh, are the ones uh, with the uh, acute coronary syndromes or undergoing percutaneous coronary and undergoing percutaneous coronary intervention. So there is no doubt that uh, uh, the uh, presence of one of loss of function allele or the presence of uh, high responsiveness uh, to clopidogrel as measured with uh, the verified with uh, the platelet function testing is associated with increased risk event. And now the next step is uh, can we use uh, this test uh, to guide antiplatelet therapy? Indeed, this hypothesis at the full start with three studies, uh, Gravitas, Arctic, and Trigger PCI, showing uh, that antithrombotic therapy was not, uh, as guided antithrombotic therapy was not associated with, with improved outcomes. There may be many reasons explaining this result, some of which are inherent uh, to uh, the study, like uh, the uh, patient selection, the strategy used to overcome uh, high platelet reactivity, the cathode use, or the power descent. But there are also limitations inherent to the methods, uh, methodics that are we uh, studying. So this is uh, the ADAPDES again. Uh, you see that uh, patient with stent thrombosis and myocardial infarction had uh, increased uh, uh, had increased median value of uh, 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 platelet reactivity unit. But you can see that there is uh, a high overlap be, uh, between patients uh, who had uh, stent thrombosis of myocardial infarction and patients who did not have these uh, events. So in technical terms, this translates in the fact that, that uh, this test has a poor uh, positive uh, predictive value. And this means uh, that when you are not able with the test uh, to discriminate healthy people from diseased people, the test is going to be of uh, little value. So for this reason, we try to combine uh, the uh, uh, responsiveness to clopidogrel with other uh, variables such that the complexity of coronary artery disease as measured by the SINTA score. And you see that 
when we stratify the population according to uh, platelet responsiveness uh, or the complexity of coronary artery disease, uh, both patients with high platelet reactivity index and those with a high asynta score that increase rates of ischemic events. But we, when we combined high platelet reactivity, uh, so patient with the platelet reactivity index more than 50% and synta score more than 15, we identified the population that had the highest risk of ischemic events. And this is uh, uh, similar with this system-wide approach in which uh, the genotyping was combined with some clinical variables like age bond demand index, chronic kidney disease, and diabetes. When uh, uh, patients were uh, stratified according to this score, those with high score had significantly higher rates of ischemic event as compared to patients with low score. So, um, in uh, view of the limitation of previous uh, trials, there have been other randomized trials that have tested uh, the efficacy and safety of guided antiplatelet therapy. So there are many trials, the results have been conflicting. Pharmaclo was interrupted prematurely um, and therefore it was under, uh, under power, even though show superiority for the net benefit. Uh, popular genetics showed non-inferiority for ne the net ben benefit, but uh, uh, it was not power for showing non-inferiority for the ischemic benefits like uh, you would expect uh, using this technology. And it was only superior for minor bleeding and not some major bleeding. Then uh, Antarctic failed superiority on uh, composite outcomes. Uh, again, uh, Taylor uh, PCI failed superiority on composite ischemic outcome. And tropical ACS was again not inferior for not net composite outcome, but again, was underpowered for showing non-inferiority for the ischemic output, and it showed no superiority for, uh, for bleeding. So uh, similarly, a meta-analysis pulled together all these studies. Uh, so there are two meta-analyses, one on overall cohort of patients with um, stable and unstable patients, uh, and one specific for acute coronary syndromes. But uh, the results of this meta-analysis has uh, suggested that guided antiplatelet therapy may be a good trade-off for balancing ischemic and bleeding events. But uh, the results of this meta-analysis should be interpreted with caution in view of the high heterogeneity that was associated with uh, the uh, estimate of risk. Therefore, uh, and this is my opinion, there are not enough data today to suggest uh, uh, genotyping or measuring uh, platelet responsiveness uh, to clopidogrel to all patients that undergo percutaneous uh, uh, coronary intervention. But there may, there may be some kind of patient who may benefit from, sta from, from these strategies. And these are those patients at highest risk of ischemic event, like those uh, with uh, stent thrombosis, uh, those with unprotected left main coronary artery stenosis, uh, complex PCI, for example, bifurcation with two stent, last remaining vessel, or patient on oral anticoagulant uh, uh, therapy were given only clopidogrel as antiplatelet therapy. And then if uh, the patient is uh, uh, resistant to clopidogrel, now we have a patient with a stent on board who has no antiplatelet therapy on board. So in conclusion, I own treatment platelet reactivity is associated with uh, increased risk of ischemic events. Both platelet function testing and genotyping can identify poor responders to clopidogrel while increased risk of ischemic events, but this test has low positive uh, predictive value. Although some recent randomized trial meta-analysis proposed guided antiplatelet therapy as the optimal antiplatelet strategy after PCI, further studies are needed to confirm this therapeutic approach. In the meantime, guided antiplatelet therapy may be reasonable for a selected group of patients at high risk of ischemic events. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Palmarini, uh, for a, a, a very insightful presentation and uh, some thought-provoking comments. Uh, we have one final presentation in this uh, section. This will be by Dr. Uh, Kimura from Kyoto, Japan, who will be speaking on optimal antithrombotic therapy after PCI uh, in Asia and Japan, uh, and why are we going our own way? Dr. Kimura. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure to make a provocative talk on optimal antithrombotic therapy after uh, PCI in Japan. So this is my disclosure. Regarding the P2Y12 inhibitor as a component of DAPT, uh, we started with ticlopidine, uh, 100 milligram BID, as compared with 250 milligram BID uh, in the global, global dose. 
Then we move to the global dose of clopidogrel, 75 milligram uh, daily. Despite use of substantially lower dose of diclopidin, our stent thrombosis rate in the J cipher registry was very low uh, with 0.34% at 30 day and 0.26% per year beyond 30 days. If we compare the 30 day outcome between Credo Kyoto uh, registry cohort two and cohort three, the rate of major breeding uh, was significantly higher in the cohort three than in the cohort two, without any difference in the rate of myocardial infarction or ischemic stroke. The dominant P2Y12 inhibitor was Japanese dose tagropin in the cohort two and global dose clopidogrel in the cohort three. After adjusting those factors affecting breathing, other than the types of the P2Y12 inhibitors, the higher risk of cohort three relative to the cohort two remains significant for major breathing. Therefore, the lower risk of major breathing in the cohort two relative to cohort three might have been related to the Japanese dose tagropin rather than global dose of clopidogrel, suggesting that less might be more in the intensity of the P2Y12 inhibitor therapy in Jap Japanese patients. With the advent of newer P2Y12 inhibitors, we adopted plus 20 milligram loading dose and 3.75 milligram daily maintenance as compared with the global dose of 60 milligram loading and 10 milligram uh, maintenance. In the Japanese pivotal uh, plus fit ACS study, the Japanese dose uh, plus grail, as compared with global dose clopidogrel was associated with the efficacy in reducing cardiovascular events comparable to that observed in the Triton TIMI38 using global dose plus grail, although the study was obviously underpowered. There was no increased risk for major breathing with the Japanese dose plus grail, as compared with uh, global dose of clopidogrel in contrast to the excess major breathing with global dose plus grail in the Triton TIMI38. Moreover, ticagrelol, which is widely used globally, is almost never used in Japan. The two East Asian uh, trials comparing ticagrelol with clopidogrel in ACS patients consistently demonstrated an excess risk of ticagrelol relative to clopidogrel not only for major breathing, but also for cardiovascular events. Therefore, we do not have any reason uh, to adopt ticagrelol. If we look at the 72 uh, P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy as compared with DAPT was not associated with the increase in cardiovascular uh, events. In nearly 14,000 SES patients, However, monotherapy with newer P2Y12 inhibitor was the dominant strategy in SCS patients in these very short uh, DAPT studies. Global doses of newer P2Y12 inhibitor are never used in Japan, and therefore we have to generate our own data as supporting uh, further the escalation of antithrombotic therapy to guide the clinical practice in Japan. In an attempt to explore a one month DAPT uh, followed by clopidogrel monotherapy in Japanese patients, we conducted two consecutive trials, such as the stopped up two, uh, including both SES and CCS patients, and the stopped up two SES, including SES patients only. We proved 3,345 patients in the stopped up two and 3,308 patients in the stopped up two SES as a stop that to total cohort. The primary endpoint was the composite of cardiovascular or breathing outcomes. The cumulative one year incidence of 2.84% in the one month group and 3.04% in the 12 months group. With a relative 50% margin on the hazard ratio scale, 
one month group was not inferior to the 12 months for the primary endpoint. As for the second, major secondary cardiovascular endpoint, the cumulative one-year incidence was 2.4% in the one-month DAPT group and 1.97% in the 12-month DAPT group, with no significant difference. As for the major secondary bleeding endpoint, the cumulative one-year incidence was significantly lower in the one-month group than in the 12-month group. 0.50% in the one month group and 1.31% in the 12 months group. This is the result for the SES and CCS subgroup analysis. There was a numerical increase in the major secondary cardiovascular endpoint in the one month group compared with the 12 months group in patients with SES, but not in patients with CCS. However, there was no treatment by subgroup interaction for SES or CCS. Regarding the major secondary breeding endpoint, the lower risk of the one month group relative to the 12 months group uh, was consistent regardless of SES or CCS without interaction. Given the very low cardiovascular event rate and significant reduction in breeding event, one month DAPT followed by clopidogrel monotherapy might be an appropriate regimen, even in SES patients, in my opinion. However, it would be important to note that both the stopped up two and the stopped up two SES trials were underpowered due to the actual event rates lower than anticipated. We have learned it would be critically important to secure adequate statistical power when designing future Japanese clinical trials in this field. What are the remaining issues on antithrombotic therapy after PCI? If we look at the breeding event in the Credo Kyoto Registry at cohort three, the rate of measure breeding at 30 day remained high as remained as high as 8.3% in patient with SES and or HBL. It was particularly high in SES patients, 15.4% uh, in SES and HBL patients, and 7.7% in SES and non-HBL patients. To reduce the major breeding events early after PCI, we are currently conducting the stopped up three trial to explore as a completely aspirin-free strategy without the APT background after cobalt chromium, a valorimus eluting stent implantation in patients with ACS or HBL. In this trial, patients are randomized before PCI, either to the no aspirin group, receiving Japanese dose plus monotherapy, or to the one month the APT group, receiving aspirin and plus Primary outcomes are to be assessed at one month. The investigators are very enthusiastic in enrolling patients even under the COVID pandemic. So far, we have enrolled more than 300 patients for the original target sample size of 3,110 patients. However, when we made a blinded evaluation of the 30 day rate of the primary bleeding, Endpoint in the initial 1,200 patients, the observed event rate of 4.2% was substantially lower than the assumed event rate of 5.8%. Similarly, the observed event rate of 3.3% for the primary cardiovascular endpoint was substantially lower than the assumed event rate of 6.2%. Accordingly, we increased the target sample size to 600 patients to maintain adequate statistical power and to make the stop that three trial to be definitive. We hope we could confirm the safety and efficacy of the complete re aspirin free strategy in this trial. So in conclusions, antithrombotic therapy in SES patients in Japan as compared with the outside Japan already being de-escalated with use of low intensity P2Y12 inhibitor. Therefore, we have to generate our own data supporting further the escalation of antithrombotic therapy to guide the clinical practice in Japan. 
the stop up two trial has suggested safety and efficacy of one month's DAPT followed by clopidogrel monotherapy after PCI in Japanese patients. We are currently conducting the stopped up three trial, which should be an adequate repellent trial exploring completely aspirin free strategy without any DAPT background in, in an attempt to reduce major bleeding early after PCI in SES and or H, HPL patients. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kimura. So we will now uh, bring in the panel for uh, about uh, eight minutes or so of uh, discussion around these uh, very interesting uh, talks in a very challenging area. I must say, um, when I first started P studying PCI pharmacology, and I'm sure Dominic and all of you probably feel the same way, it was it was easy. We had one drug, um, you know, one kinds of stents, um, one you know, one type of strategy, and now we have. Uh, you know, multiple drugs, we have multiple different tests, we have uh, many different ways to adjust. Uh, we can adjust doses, we can, you know, shorten the therapy, de-escalate, escalate. It's um, getting awfully complicated to keep track of things, which is why I'm glad that Dominic and Tulio are uh, doing uh, meta-analyses to try to help us uh, uh, clarify all this. So let me open this up uh, uh, to the panel. And actually, let me let me start with a question that I'd like each, each one to uh, address, which is, um, are you using uh, any of these testing strategies, whether it's genotyping or platelet function testing on a you know, routine um, basis in your own practices? And if so, sort of how and when? So uh, let me start with Dr. Schipke, um, can give us the German approach um, and uh, to, your, to your practice. So how, how often are you doing testing? Well, um, actually, I'm in a practice now, so I'm no longer working in the hospital. And there, the situation is completely different because uh, neither platelet function testing nor genetic testing is available. And this is also a question uh, for me to, to Dominic. Um, do you think that we really need uh, genetic testing or platelet function testing if you do not have the, the availability? I mean. Do you think it is sufficient to just uh, do a, 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 a guided strategy by clinical factors? Or do you think um, that we are treating the patients worse, um, that this is really a clinical need um, So if, if it's not available? So in my situation now, I would have to send the patient to the clinic because uh, I don't have the possibility, even though I'm in Germany. Um, Yes, and my, my second question to Dominic is, um, what do you tell people that are afraid about the number of patients that have been included in the trials assessing de-escalation or escalation? Because the number of patients was much smaller than in the trials that have shown the superiority of the potent p 2 12 receptor inhibitors. Those are good questions. Dominic, you want to take them on? <laughs> yeah, so so let me start off with the first question. You know, obviously for, for, for years and in 90 plus percent of centers across the globe, uh, uh, PCI had been performed uh, without objective testing. So the, the short answer is yes, of course it is safe and, and okay to do that. The rationale, however, for doing uh, testing is really to understand how we can further fine tune uh, uh, our approach in our selection of therapies because uh, there is still a residual ischemic risk and bleeding risk. Uh, and so the question is, what can we do to uh, improve upon that? And I do believe that the meta-analysis that were shown by uh, me and, and, and Tulio uh, have shown that. And also uh, Stephanie has uh, also shown by your the group in the tropical ACS, uh, yes, we can. Uh, it was designed for non-inferiority, but you very well know there was a clear trend in reduction in, in bleeding. And the ischemic outcomes were actually going in the better direction as, as well. So the short answer, it is a way to fine tune. Unfortunately, these trials are not 20,000 patient trials. So to answer the second question, uh, uh, sponsored by Big Pharma, uh, i.e. studies with Prasugo or Ticagalor, uh, so we, I think we were just not there yet in terms of size of the trials. However, if we were to be able to conduct a big trial of de-escalation, for example, with 10,000 patients, 
let's say, a tropical ACS with de-escalation, uh, either functional genetic testing, uh, I think uh, we would see what we see in the meta-analysis. Are you planning any of the uh, such a trial? I've been dreaming to do it for the past 20 years. <laughs> the big pharma does not <laughs> want to invest in it. Yeah, so it's a problem of funding, right? Yeah. yeah. The uh, let me ask the same question to um, uh, perhaps to uh, KW. So you've been studying platelets forever. Um, how how often and and when and how are you doing platelet you know platelet function or genetic testing or some form of of stratification yeah. in your patients? Yeah. So I mean. Um, um, as a short answer, it would be, you know, no, I don't do the routine testing. Um, uh, I work at a place where um, the majority of the patients uh, are enrolled in, in different studies. And, and I'm probably the one in the, the probably one of the few doctors in Korea who performs the most amount of PFT assays and the genetic studies in, in these patients. However, um, from the point of routine clinical practice, uh, I feel that uh, you know, it, it's a great topic in terms of research, but I don't think it has the discriminatory value that, that adds enough value that, you know, justifies its use um, in, in routine clinical practice. And especially nowadays uh, when we treat the ACS patients and we have the availability of the newer, more potent P2I12 inhibitors, uh, I think that the issue of, uh, you know, you know um, non-response or, or um, you know, uh, reduced response to the, the P2I12 inhibitors are less of an issue. And I feel that it's more of how are we going to select the patients that we're going to quickly bring back to a de-escalated sort of regimen. Um, and, and that's more of a challenge, I think, currently than, than um, you know, which patients are going to not respond to the, to the agents nowadays. Having said that, I, I feel that the approach uh, Dominique, uh, uh, you know, mentioned in terms of uh, you know, maybe using the genetic testing to figure out the patients that will respond well to clopidogrel may be a way, you know, in the future to discriminate the, the patients that will do well on, you know, on just clopidogrel rather than continuing the really, uh, you know, potent P2I12 inhibitors that will, you know, put our patients at more risk, especially, you know, our East Asian patients. Great. Well, I'm Dr. An from uh, Samsung Medical Center, Seoul, Korea. Uh, in daily practice, I do not routinely perform genetic or platelet function tests, uh, but uh, guiding may be helpful in patients with special conditions, uh, such as those receiving clopidogrel monotherapy after stabilization or patients uh, with recurrent major adverse events. So now we are conducting smart choice three trial, which compares clopidogrel monotherapy versus aspirin monotherapy in stabilized patients. And we are uh, doing uh, some platelet function test and genetic function test, but it, it, the results uh, uh, are blinded to the investigators. Well, that's good to hear. That sounds like a very, you know, I mean, that, that certainly is an area that makes sense uh, that uh, if we're going to be just giving a patient clopidogrel, it would be nice to know if it's actually working. Um, in those uh, in those patients, it's kind of amazing to me that it seems to work pretty well, um, despite you know in uh, Korea and Japan where there is such a high prevalence of uh, uh, the polymorphisms um, uh, uh, around. I was going to ask uh, uh, Dominic uh, this, but uh, since I, I didn't have a chance, I'm curious if anyone has feelings as to you know if you had to choose, you know, would it be better to do genetic testing or would it be better to do platelet function testing? And uh, is there anyone who wants to take that on? Dr. Chen, you're, you're nodding. So I'm going to assume you have something yes. that I say. Also, it's my question. <laughs> oh, it was your question, not the answer. <laughs> That's not fair. The, uh, well, let's ask KW. KW has spent a lot of time. Yeah, I mean, this. from my perspective, you know, an ACS, uh, ACS patient, I would start them on a potent P2I12 inhibitor. I would do a genetic testing just from the baseline to know whether this person responds well to clopidogrel, I would do a clinical assessment of the risk of their bleeding versus ischemic risk. Um, you know, if their bleeding risk is high, I would put them on single uh, clopidogrel uh, if they're a good responder to, uh, to clopidogrel. If not, I would use a reduced dose of the P2I, uh, potent P2I12 inhibitor after the critical period of maybe one to three months. 
the okay. uh, that sounds frighteningly also, practical. Go ahead, Dr. Chen. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I also uh, want to share my uh, personal experience. Um, uh, yeah, in China, uh, for the uh, genetic uh, uh, test, it's not a routine way, and also it's not covered by the reimbursement. And also, uh, uh, platelet function testing also is not a, a routine way. So uh, uh, generally, for the SIS case, and also uh, like the uh, Dominic uh, also mentioned, uh, very uh, uh, complex PCI or uh, uh, clinical uh, uh, quite complex issue. Generally, we uh, use the uh, aspirin and plus uh, chigrilla because. Uh, uh, press grill is not available, not uh, like uh, in Japan, not available in China. And uh, uh, for, for my personal view, uh, if for the um, genetic testing, we have uh, this uh, technique, uh, but it's not uh, uh, can get uh, fastly uh, to get a result until now in China. Generally, if the case, uh, very complex case, and we just want to aspirin and plus tigrilla, but also uh, with a very high risk uh, major bleeding uh, issue, generally we uh, uh, recommend it to for the general type uh, to, to find uh, whether or not we need to uh, uh, accreditation for the therapy for this case. So um, I think this is quite an important issue for the uh, until now, maybe the, in China, platelet function testing uh, not a routinely uh, class clinical pathway, but uh, is major, majority uh, strategy uh, selected by the uh, physicians compared to the um, genetic types. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I think we are um, running into the next session. So I, I don't want to take away from the, uh, uh, the, the next discussion. So let me okay. thank the panelists for the discussion here um, and uh, turn it back over to my co-moderator, uh, Dr. D.W. Park, um, who's going to present the, uh, uh, the next series of uh, presentations. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. This is a very nice uh, discussion. So I'm going to move to the switch gear to the second round. It's about the duration issue and the depth duration and antithrombotic duration. After three consecutive le lectures, we also have a very debatable uh, discussion time. And uh, I'm going to introduce the next speaker. And everybody know when is a very renowned uh, physician and uh, uh, Bobby Yeb from Harvard University. And uh, he will talk uh, talk to depth trial, uh, longer is better versus contemporary trial, shorter is better. How can you reduce the knowledge gap? Bobby? Hi, I'm here to talk about the DAP study versus contemporary trials. How can we reduce the knowledge gap? These are my disclosures and funding. So in mythology, we know that Odysseus had to nav be navigate between the two dangers, Scylla and Charybdis. He had to navigate this narrow passage between these two. And as cardiologists, we often have to navigate the narrow strait between bleeding and thrombosis. That has been the challenge with identifying the optimal DAPT strategy for individual patients. Now I was asked to talk about the DAP study and how to reconcile the DAP study with more contemporary data that maybe showed that shorter durations are better. And one thing I'll take issue with is whether or not the DAP study truly showed that longer duration is better. Here are the results of the DAP study, which you'll recall was a comparison of 30 versus 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy uh, among patients receiving uh, drug eluting and bare metal stents. And it showed a reduction in stent thrombosis, myocardial function, and MACE but at the expense of an increase in gusto and moderate, in moderate to severe bleeding. And I would say that the actual takeaway of the DAP study is that the DAP study illustrated quite clearly that there are trade-offs, not that longer was better. Now, there have been several studies since then, and at the same time, actually, that suggested that shorter is better. And these are the studies that I'm gonna to try to reconcile with the data from the DAP study. And those are a group of contemporaneous comparators to the DAP study, which were the Italic, Prodigy, Reset, Optimized, Excellent, Nippon, and Security studies. A group of more contemporary studies in the HBR populations. And then a group of another more contemporary studies evaluating shorter duration of DAP in which DAP was defined differently than the original DAP study. Or I should say then in which single antiplatelet therapy was defined differently. 
So why the differences between the results of these studies? Well, the first reason is different study designs. Now I'm speaking specifically here about the studies that were conducted at the same time as the DAP study years ago. And a comparison to the DAP study, none of those trials were conducted uh, were individually powered for ischemic endpoints such as stent thrombosis. Most included randomization at the index procedure such that the treatment arms were not actually receiving different therapies for the first three to six months of the trial, which we know would bias study results to the null. None were placebo controlled and blinded and several were terminated early. So at that time, I think it's fair to say that the DAP study provided the highest quality evidence at the time of its publication compared to the others. Now, why other differences between uh, studies that have shown maybe that shorter DAP duration was better compared to the DAP study? Well, many of these studies were in HBR populations. And if you remember the DAP study, actually this was explicitly not an HBR population. It's also remember, important to remember that many of these studies, including the leaders free trial, Onyx-1, uh, Zion's short DAP, and Evolve short DAP, were not RCTs of DAP duration. So the single trial of HBR population, which was uh, of, of DAP duration, was actually the master DAP study. And in this study uh, versus the DAP study, these are essentially non-overlapping patient populations. Master DAP with high bleeding, high, bleeding, high bleeding risk patients, patients are all anticoagulation many times. These had to be patients who had no events in the first month after PCI. Whereas in the DAP study, these excluded patients are all anticoagulation and those with a history of bleeding and excluded patients with any events in the first year after PCI. So these are very different patient populations. Reason number three, different treatments. What does three months of DAPT mean in 2011 versus 2021? Well, in 2011, when you talked about DAPT, you were talking about aspirin and clopidogrel, and then you were mostly talking about aspirin monotherapy when you were talking about de-escalating DAPT. But in 2011 or 2021, you might be talking about aspirin and ticagrelor followed by aspirin monotherapy, aspirin prasugrel followed by aspirin monotherapy. You might be talking about aspirin clopidogrel followed by clopidogrel monotherapy, aspirin ticagrelor followed by ticagrelor monotherapy, as well as the many de-escalation strategies there are of lower dose PDY12 inhibitors. So DAPT versus SAPT nowadays in 2021 is a very ambiguous terminology. And I would argue that the nomenclature is no longer meaningful for us. Reason number four, these are different eras, different stents, different patient populations. So one question that one might ask is what would the DAPT study show if it were conducted today? Well, the patient characteristics have changed. We think that patients have gotten older and maybe more complex over time. And we definitely know that the stents have changed. So imagine this theoretical exercise. If we could take the original trial population here in the middle of the, of the figure, and if we could just reweight the trial population to look more like what a real world contemporaneous population looked like. Well, it turns out that there is a method to do this where you can take a clinical trial population, actually reweight the sample to look like what clinical practice looks like. And these are methods that were actually developed by my colleague Issa Dahabra here at the Harvard School of Public Health with Miguel Hernan. These are designs that extend causal inferences from randomized trials to a new target, quote unquote, target population. Well, we took the DAP trial and we linked it to the NCDR registry, which is a contemporaneous population, a contem excuse me, a contemporary population of real world patients undergoing PCI. And we basically reweighted the DAP study to look more like what the NCDR cath PCI looks like today, including both the stent type and the patient distribution. This is the fancy math that we did to basically do this reweighting exercise. And when we did it, this is what we found. Well, we knew that these patients had different clinical characteristics. Uh, between the registry and the DAP study. And there were different technologies, of course, with the registry patients receiving newer generation drug eluting stents in the contempt, uh, right now compared to the DAP study, which only had about half of the patients receiving what would now be considered contemporary stents. And when we reweighted the original DAP study, what we found is this. Here I show you in the saw the lines the comparison of 30 versus 30 months versus 12 months DAP for the outcome of MACE. And when we reweight the patient populations, actually, you see that the lines are much closer. And actually, this difference became non significant. So, after transporting the DAP study randomized treatment effect 
to the NCDR cath PCI target population, we actually found no significant reduction in stent thrombosis or MACE in the reweighted sample, but a persistent increase in bleeding with longer DAP duration. We also found, importantly, that the DAP store still distinguishes patients with a net benefit over harm. So, uh, Dr. Yu and Krumholtz actually uh, editorialized our article in circulation last month and, and called the study uh, an evidence based medicine when the magic of randomized clinical trial meets real world data. And we thought this was a useful example of how we could update trial results as patient characteristics and technologies change. So in summary, how do we reconcile old data with new? The DAP study, I think the data are reconcilable with contemporary DAP duration trials. The DAP study demonstrated the strong need for individualization of abdomen platelet strategies. I still don't think it should ever be viewed as a longer is better trial. It was a trial that showed trade-offs. This is still true today. There have been improvements in stent design that have diminished the benefits of longer DAP duration. That was true in the contemporary trials that have been conducted. And it's true when we reweight the DAP study to look more like populations today. DAPT and SAPT may no longer be useful terms in our lexicon as the regimens we use become more nuanced. And I'd argue this, that randomized clinical trials testing one strategy versus another in a very broad heterogeneous patient population, they may be less useful than those focusing on specific target populations of high interest going forward. Thanks very much for listening, and I'm sorry I could not be there participating in person. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. So I'm going to move to the next speaker, and uh, uh, she's a, a trial PI, August trial. She's my friend and TCRI alumna, and the Dr. Renato Lopez from TCRI. He will uh, talking about the depth duration and NUAC selection in the AP PCI patient. Renato? Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for the invitation to participate um, in this meeting. And the title of my talk is Depth Duration and NOAC Selection in Patients with AFib Undergoing PCI, Where Do We Stand uh, in 2022? So here are my disclosures. So it's important to understand that patients with atrial fibrillation who undergo PCI, it's a very common clinical scenario. If we look at patients with AFib that at some point in their lives, we will undergo PCI and therefore get a stent and therefore require antiplatelet anti therapy. Uh, these numbers are very high. There are millions of these patients all over the world. So it's important to know how to treat them from the antithrombotic therapy point of view. And if we could summarize the problem, here is what we find. I need to use dual antiplatelet therapy, aspirin plus a P2I2 inhibitor to prevent stent thrombosis, myocardial infarction, and recurrent ischemia. And I also have to use anticoagulants uh, to prevent stroke because patients have atrial fibrillation. And when I combine anticoagulants with DAPT, what's so-called triple therapy, the risk of bleeding goes exponentially high. And the bad news is that there is no way we can treat the stent thrombosis, stroke, and the bleeding at the same time. So if that's not possible, what should we do? And we should be able to find what I've been calling the anti-thrombotic sweet spot. And what does that mean? That, mean that, that means that I have to be able to find the right doses of the right drugs for the correct duration that can give me the greatest reduction in stroke and other ischemic events at a minimal cost of bleeding. And if we do that, then um, we can give the best to our patients. But that seems to be easy to find. However, when we look at the possible combinations, when we look at the possible um, strategies uh, of antithrombotic therapies, there are 2.8 million ways 
to treat these patients. If I look at all the antiplatelet therapies and different doses, all the anticoagulants and different doses and different durations of treatment, we have 2.8 million ways and it's impossible for any guidelines to contemplate 2.8 million ways to treat these patients. So if that's not possible, um, how should we do to address this problem? And the only other way is to then select a few of these 2.8 million options and test them in randomized clinical trials. That's the way to do it. And that's exactly what we did. In the last years, we've done four trials in this field. Pioneer A PCI, Redo PCI, Augustus, and Interest PCI. So these four trials, as we can appreciate here, they are different among themselves. They tested different drugs at different doses, in different regimens, even in different trial designs. As we can appreciate, for example, um, Augustus has a unique trial design of being a two by two factorial design, whereas Pioneer and Redo, for example, had three arm trial. Also the populations were not necessarily the same. Every trial included a patient with a FIB undergoing PCI and getting a stent. Augustus also included these patients, but also did include uniquely patients with acute coronary syndrome medically managed. In other words, treated without a PCI or an invasive approach, but only medically. So included a, a broader spectrum of the coronary artery disease patients. So it's important to understand those trials designs, the strength and limitations of each of these trials to be able to put the results into perspective. Augustus is the largest trial and has the unique aspect of being a two by two factorial design where we compare a Pixaband versus warfarin, but also aspirin versus placebo in a double blind fashion. And that was very unique. Unique because it gave us the treatment effect of a Pixaband versus warfarin, demonstrating that a Pixaband reduced the risk of bleeding by 31% independent of aspirin or no aspirin. And that's the unique aspect of the two by two factorial design. Then when you look at the aspirin, we also demonstrated the aspirin increased risk of bleeding by 89%. And this increase was independent of the choice of oral anticoagulant. So really important to, to have this design because it gave us the reduction in bleeding of using a Pixaban versus warfarin and of avoiding aspirin versus using aspirin. And those results are independent of each other. When you look at all together, if I use a Pixaban without aspirin, only with a P2I12 inhibitor, it shows me that I have the greatest reduction in bleeding um, with an 11.4% absolute risk reduction uh, in bleeding with this strategy compared to the classic triple therapy, which gives us a number needed to treat of only nine. If I treat patients with a Pixaban without aspirin, only with Clopidogrel, for example, I need to treat only nine patients to avoid one bad bleed. However, when we look at the aspirin versus placebo comparison and we look at stent thrombosis, we found numerically higher rates of stent thrombosis in the placebo group, suggest, suggesting that maybe aspirin has an uh, impact, even if it's small, in reducing uh, ischemic events, particularly stent thrombosis. But importantly, we learned that most of the stent thrombosis is really happening in the first 30 days. 80% of the stent thrombosis are happening in the first 30 days. And then we did this very nice and sophisticated analysis where we look in the first 30 days on the left, uh, we look at bad bleed bleeding events. And on the right, we look at bad ischemic events in the first 30 days comparing aspirin versus placebo. 
And we can appreciate that in the first 30 days, aspirin increased bad bleeds, but at the same time, aspirin reduced bad ischemic events such as CV death, choke, MI, and stent thrombosis in an almost one-to-one -one ratio. So in the first 30 days after PCI, aspirin does increase bleeding, but also does save uh, ischemic events in a one-to-one -one ratio. But after 30 days, that's very important to ob observe that aspirin continues to increase bad bleeding events, but now has no effect whatsoever in ischemic events. So that's very important because it gives us very important insight on for how long should we use aspirin in case of high risk of stent thrombosis. If we put all this in a meta-analysis, which we've done, we can appreciate that without a doubt, the safest regimen for these patients is to use a NOAC in the appropriate dose to prevent stroke in patients with AFib, plus a P2I12 inhibitor like clopidogrel without aspirin. That's the regimen that's gonna be the safest. And we don't have, by using that regimen, we don't pay a high cost in terms of stent thrombosis or myocardial infarction. And this meta-analysis has the highest quality data with almost 12,000 patients. So this is the summary of the meta-analysis. The NOAC plus a P2I12 inhibitor is the regimen that is associated with the lower risk of bleeding, including intracranial hemorrhage, without any difference in ischemic events. When I compare, for example, with the classic triple therapy with warfarin plus aspirin plus clopidogrel. So in summary, and answering to the title question, in patients with a fever and a recent ACS and PCI, the use of a NOAC at the appropriate dose for stroke prevention, plus a P2I12 inhibitor uh, without the aspirin should be the preferred treatment option. Therefore, that duration should be only around one week after PCI. That's what the trials did around the time of PCI no more than one week. But in selected cases, if the risk of stent thrombosis and other ischemic events are high, then keeping aspirin a little bit longer, therefore keeping DAPT a little bit longer for 30 days is a reasonable approach, but not more than 30 days. Now we have more consistency across the guidelines with more level of evidence A for those recommendations, because now we have high quality data. And remember that the management of these patients, if we're gonna test another option or another regimen, we should do it in randomized trials. That's the best way to treat any new um, strategy. If we look at the 2020 ESC guidelines for non-ST elevation ACS plus AFib, that's exactly what we can um, see, that the default is triple therapy and therefore adapt only for around one week after PCI. And after that, we go with double therapy. And then after 12 months, we stop the antiplatelet and go only with anticoagulant. The AFib guidelines of the ESC 2020 also confirm this approach. And more recently, the North America perspective that we published in circulation also demonstrated the use of DAPT only for around one week and for triple therapy for around one week after the PCI. And after that, going with only double therapy for 12 months, for the remaining 11 months, completing 12 months of treatment. And after that, only anticoagulant alone. So this is our job to find the antithrombotic street spot that I mentioned. And what does that mean? I'm gonna find the right drug at the right dose in the right combinations according to patient characteristics and the clinical scenario characteristics around the angiogram and then um, use that in a dynamic way in the first week versus first month versus first year that can provide the greatest reduction in each point, in each time point, the greatest reduction in ischemic events and a minimal cost of bleeding. It's important to minimize bleeding but preserve the efficacy. And if we do that, we found the antithrombotic street spot and we can give the best treatment to our patients. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Renato. So I'm gonna the, ask uh, the last lecture is about the long-term management story and PCI application. We invited honorably and PI of a fire trial, Dr. Satoshi Yasuda from uh, Tohoku uh, University School in Japan and uh, ask a long-term antithrombotic strategy in PCI application insight from a fire trial. Dr. Yasuda. Thank you, Chairperson, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to have opportunity for speech in this particular session. I would like to talk about long-term antithrombotic strategy in PCI and AVF patients, insights from the FIA trial. This slide discloses the conflict of interest. After 12 months of combination therapy, our inpatient with atrial fibrillation, AF, and stable coronary artery disease, CAD, not requiring intervention, then oral anticoagulant or monotherapy is recommended. However, this approach was not fully described with evidence from randomized control trial in 2018 guidelines. Furthermore, substantial number of patients in this situation continue to be treated with combination therapy, which indicates a gap between guideline and clinical practice. The AFIRE study was designed to investigate whether the rivaroxaban monotherapy was non inferior to the combination therapy rivaroxaban plus an antiplatelet agent in patient with AF and stable CAD. AFIRE was the most center prospective randomized open level parallel group trial. We randomly assigned a patient with AF who had undergone percutaneous coronary intervention, PCI, or coronary artery bypass grafting more than one year earlier, or who had angiographically confirmed CAD with stenosis of 50% and more, not requiring revascularization, to receive monotherapy with rivaroxaban of a combination therapy with rivaroxaban plus a single antiplatelet agent. The trial population received the rivaroxaban dose approved in Japan, 10 mg or 50 mg once daily according to the patient's creatinine clearance. Primary efficacy endpoint was the composite of stroke, systemic embolism, myocardial infarction, unstable angina requiring revascularization, or death from any cause. Primary safety endpoint was major bleeding as defined in according to the criteria of the ISTH. The trial population received the rivaroxaban dose approved in Japan, 10 mg or 15 mg once daily, according to the patient creatinine clearance, rather than globally approved once daily dose of 20 mg. However, Pharmacokinetic modeling has shown that the level of rivaroxaban in blood samples obtained from Japanese patients who were taking rivaroxaban at the 15 mg doses were similar to the level in white patients who were taking the 20 mg dose. At the baseline, the characteristics of the patients were similar in the two treatment group. The mean age was 74 years, and 79% of patients were men, and 17.6% had undergone previous PCI, and 11.4% had undergone pre previous coronary bypass. A total of 1,444 patients had undergone coronary stenting with drug eluting stent death. The median CHAD score was 2, the median CHAD DISPASS score was 4, and the median has bread score was 2. Among patients in the combination therapy, 70.2% received aspirin and 26.8% received P2Y12 inhibitors. 
This slide shows the result as shown in the left panel of the primary efficacy endpoint. Levarotab monotherapy was known inferior to the combination therapy for the primary efficacy endpoint with event rate of 4.14% for the monotherapy and 5.75% for the combination therapy. The hazard ratio was 0.72 with p-value below 0.001 for non-inferiority. In the assessment for the superiority for the primary efficacy endpoint, that was not pre-specified, the p-value was 0.02. As shown in the right panel of the primary safety endpoint, rivaroxaban monotherapy was superior to the combination therapy for the primary safety endpoint, with event rate of 1.62% for the monotherapy and 2.76% for the combination therapy. The hazard ratio was 0.59 with p-value of 0.01 for the superiority. Our results support the general concept that the rivaroxaban monotherapy with the anti therapy is better approach for the patient with AF and stable CAD. So we have performed several analysis of a fire to investigate the association between bleeding and subsequent measured bus cardiac and cerebral vascular event. Mace incidence was higher in patients with bleeding than those without 8.38% versus 4.20%. Time adjusted Cox multivariate analysis revealed temporal association between measured bleeding and subsequent mace with particularly high mass risk with 30 days after the major breathing with a hazard ratio of 7.81. So these findings suggest that the monotherapy might have prevented the occurrence of cardiovascular events or deaths after major breathing in the FIRE trial. Substantial, theoretical, basic, and clinical evidence suggests and the causal relationship between bleeding and subsequent cardiovascular events. Bleeding activates the coagulation cascade and upregulation cytokines such as the plasminogen activator inhibitor 1 pi 1. Large breeze produce a hypovolemia and anemia uh, which reduce oxygen delivery and cause the reflux tachycardia. Uh, which increase the oxygen demand and can lead to myocardial ischemia. Blood transfusion produces uh, secondary biochemical changes that adversely impact microcirculatory flow, hypoxia-induced vasodilation, and oxygen delivery. Taken together, the finding of a FIRE trial, reduction of reading risk is a key to achieving the better long-term outcome in patients with CAD and uh, atrial fibrillation. We performed subgroup analysis of the FIRE trial, examining the benefits of rivaroxaban monotherapy in patients with AF exclusively after coronary stenting in terms of efficacy and safety outcomes, and the benefit correlation with time elapsed after coronary stenting. Among 1,404 patients who had undergone coronary stenting beyond one year before enrollment, the benefits of monotherapy became apparent as more time elapsed from stenting to trial enrollment. We performed subgroup analysis according to type of stent bare metal versus death, type of drug editing stent, second generation and first generation, and number of vessels, one vessels versus multi vessels or left main drug, and uh, regional site, LED versus others. Among patients with AF after coronary stenting, the benefit of levaloxaban monotherapy 
for the efficacy endpoint as shown in the upper and the safety endpoint as shown in the lower were consistent irrespective of stand type and region site and the benefit was even greater in patients with multi-vessel disease or left main trunk disease than one vessel disease with respect to a safety endpoint. In the recent study published in Circulation Research, Factor 10A was identified as a potent platelet agonist that acts through power 1. Therefore, Libroxaburn exerts an antiplatelet effect that together with its well-known potent anticoagulatory capacity must lead to reduced frequency of atherosthrombotic events and improved outcome in patient. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the clinical need for antithrombotic therapy with risk stratification for treatment duration and composition has been increasing, in particular for Asian population characterized as a higher risk of bleeding events and lower risk of ischemic events. Antithrombotic therapy for AF and CAD has been shifting to a less is more concept regimen. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yasuda. And we will have a 12 and 15 minute uh, discussion time. I think this session is composed of very hot debated important session. Uh, first, uh, the Dr. Ye uh, lecture is a summary about the uh, knowledge gap, the depth trial period, also contemporary trial period. So my first question to the Dr. Shubke, and the, you are the PI of ISA REACT-5 trial, you're comparing prosecutor versus uh, Ticagalin in HS patient. I, I know in the, your team also designed ISA REACT-6 trial at discharge time uh, in HS comparing without aspirin, prosecutor versus ticagrelor. So absolutely in concept of a duration of depth is a different story in depth trial. Is it, could you comment on that the, in contemporary era? What is the real the depth duration? How do you think about that? Um, so the depth duration in ISA React 5 was according to the guidelines. So prosecutor and ticagrelor were both uh, given uh, for one year. Um, and I think this is still the default strategy. Um, and um, as we have learned, there are millions of possibilities to individualize therapy. And one very attractive option is uh, to skip aspirin. And uh, I, th I think this is uh, a, a very attractive concept that will be tested further now. But uh, still, it's, um, I think it's too early to consider the default strategy. So. I think it's still uh, a long way uh, to go and uh, many things to learn. And um, um, yeah, so. Okay, thank you. So I, I do like second question, Dr. Junya Ako, and uh, you also, I know interventional cardiologist and the uh, fire trial was performed uh, in Japan is only available one trial about the story for long-term duration of uh, uh, antithrombic therapy in Asia AP patients. So how do you, in your practice, do you routinely the, adapt a uh, uh, fire trial result? In the, some, for instance, some patient is a uh, one year after PCI left main stenting, put the three and four, the complex bifurcation stenting, one another story is just a middle RCA single stenting. Is that how do you adapt a fire trial result in your cataract? That's a, thank you very much. Uh, that's a very good question. And the, uh, as an uh, co-investigator of uh, a fire trial, I am very much confident that the uh, uh, anti uh, coagulant alone is the way to go. And the uh, for the very high risk patients, such as uh, bifurcation two stenting or three stenting, I would say that for those patients only, I think I would keep them uh, with antiplatelet and anticoagulant. But as for left main stenting, uh, crossover alone, then I would go for uh, anticoagulant alone. So uh, for that reason, most of my patients are already on uh, 
uh, at the Aquarium at the Long. Great. With David, you comment? Yes. The, I mean, I think the fire trial is a is a you know terrific and very important trial. I would you know certainly um, uh, like to see it replicated, and and I believe there is a trial going on uh, in Europe currently um, that is uh, uh, looking um, at that you know uh, uh, again. Um, and I think will be very helpful, hopefully, to replicate the results and give us increased confidence. It's interesting. Um, we just literally just yesterday there was a, a fairly extensive discussion initiated by uh, 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 Dr. Savage from uh, Philadelphia uh, on Twitter about what you know what to actually do in practice. What are people doing with a poll? And 50% of the respondents, uh, probably a lot of Americans, uh, said that at a year after you know, after a, you know, relatively straightforward uh, DES in a, in a risky patient, a diabetic with heart failure, um, who was on, you know, uh, an oral anticoagulant, they would not stop the aspirin. Um, interesting. And uh, I mean, I think a lot of people, first of all, don't know about the AFIRE trial. It didn't get as much uh, play in the United States, I think, as perhaps it got in Asia, which is a shame because it's, you know, it's, it's fundamentally important. Uh, but in addition, they're just people are nervous uh, about it. I've talked to my partners and they said, really, we're supposed to stop uh, the aspirin? The, it doesn't, you know, I'm scared to do that. Um, and so I think we still need one more trial, although, again, I, I think it's one of the a, a really provocative and important study. That, so I'm, I'm hoping uh, that the new trial will, will confirm it so that we can be much more confident. Great. So, and, uh, doc, Dr. Chen and the KW and the Zhu Yonghan, any question to the Professor Yasuda and the uh, uh, PI of a uh, fire trial? And the, you are all is an interventional cardiologist. How do you think? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Lady yeah. first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> lady first. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Chen. I think the uh, uh, fire trial is quite an uh, interesting. Uh, uh, results and also uh, deal with uh, uh, the uh, mono therapy for the Novak uh, for the atrial fibrillation combined the stable uh, coronary heart disease. And uh, in China, generally uh, for the process standing, even uh, for the uh, one year later, uh, especially for bifurcation or multiple vessel disease, uh, multiple standing. If uh, uh, totally uh, mm, uh, totally uh, uh, discontinue use the antiplatelet therapy, um, until now is a lot of concern uh, concerns for for that. Generally, it's a uh, plavix, uh, 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 lower dosage and uh, plus uh, uh, Novak uh, with a low uh, low dosage. That is a routine way. Uh, but to uh, follow the uh, fire trial, I think uh, uh, we also can uh, separate uh, the, uh, the, uh, give, uh, the individual strategy uh, for some uh, single vessel uh, standing and also quite stable. Also check by the CT scanning and show is everything is fine. I think the monotherapy with uh, a Novak uh, is uh, rec recommended. So maybe in the future, I will, I would like to try. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, Chu Yong Han, is it to, any question to the uh, I, Dr. Yasuda? Uh, several years ago, I insisted uh, we have to use uh, antiplatelet agent with NOAA uh, in patients undergoing PCI, but nowadays I'm gradually uh, adopting the off-fire strategy, NOAA monotherapy, uh, without uh, aspirin or clopidogrel. But I fully agree with Dr. Ako. So as an interventionist, I'm a little bit concerned about the complex lesion. So I have a question to Dr. Yasta. So uh, could you uh, please tell us the proportion of uh, patients undergoing complex PCI, such as bifurcation to stenting, left main or CT long lesions? And the second question is, uh, I wonder, the years uh, from the last uh, PCI in the uh, fire tr trial, the median uh, time, so one year, two year, or three years? Yeah, thank you very much. You're a great interest to a fire trial. And uh, um, yeah, you, I would like to answer the second question. 
Um, the uh, elapsed time uh, of the stent implantation uh, in was uh, uh, two point five years on average. And uh, your first question is about what? A proportion of a patient should undergo ah. a complex piece size, such as a long CTO or a left main or bifurcation to stent. Yeah, that's a very important question, but uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't, uh, we did not uh, correct the uh, uh, detail of the procedure or detail of coronary artery anatomy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is an open question comment for the panel, and the, you know, the less than one year we uh, require four trial for guideline change pioneer AP residual trial interest and August trial. After one year, we just available a uh, fire trial. Do you everyone think we require each drug specific trial using uh, epixaban or the, the another the edoxaban something like that? How do you think? Is it Yasuda or any David? Uh, I, I mean, I I was going to ask that same question. Is that you know does it because in the United States in particular, um, it, in many patients are you know we have four different DOACs that are available. Um, and a lot of times patients really can't, you, you can't switch them because it's based on which insurance plan they have that one is um, much less expensive for them to take. Uh, you know, it's, it, I mean, I, I would like to think, and we act, I mean, I, I do think we act like um, the DOACs are fairly interchangeable there. I think, you know, of the four, the one I would be least confident of is the Bigatran, which is, has, a, you know, um, a different mechanism of action than the other three. Um, and, you know, and I do think the other, you know, um, if anything, the level of anticoagulant therapy with, uh, uh, um, you know, a, a pixaban or with a doxaban um, is as high or higher than with a rivaroxaban, just based on the dosing in the U.S. So I would be fairly confident with, with those two, less confident with the bigotram. But I would definitely like to ask, you hear what Dr. Yasuda has to say about uh, the choice of uh, of the uh, uh, the DOAC and whether whether it matters to, to him. Okay, two hand raise up. KW first. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, a short answer to that would be um, I I think it would depend on the level of antiplatelet effect of the each individual DOAC um, because one of the reasons why we should be confident in using a single um, NOAC after the first year is the fact that it has antiplatelet effects um, and. Second uh, comment I have um, is that um, regarding, you know, uh, even though a fire was a wonderful study, um, you know, they didn't do a specific analysis on the very complex lesions. So we really don't have direct evidence on what to do in these complex PCI patients. But, um, you know, indirectly, uh, if you look at a paper that we published a, a couple of years ago, we showed that um, the, the, procedural factors mainly matter in the first six months uh, post-PCI. And once you go beyond the first year, it's the clinical risk factors that you have that determine most of the outcomes and not the procedural factors. So, I mean, I wouldn't be so concerned once the person, once the patient does well within the first year, I wouldn't be so concerned about, you know, uh, you know, having to have um, uh, an antiplatelet um, drug on board just because the patient had a you know, a CTO opened a year ago, because if the patients has, have been doing fine for one year, I, I don't think that would be such a big problem. And my final comment uh, for David would be, you know, Michael Savage needs to read a uh, host exam and, and he, needs to, he needs to know that patients need to be on clopidogrel rather than on aspirin um, uh, on long-term therapy. So <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a joke. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's just a joke. Okay, Dr. Shubke, any comment? You yeah. uh, raise your hand. Okay. Regarding the question of the comparability of the NOACs, um, I think we really need a head-to-head -head comparison of the four NOACs. And I would have loved to do this trial. You know, we have compared Prasugel and Hakegelor, and I think what is really missing in the field is a head-to-head -head comparison of the NOACs, because we only have the comparison against uh, vitamin K antagonists. And... Uh, we basically look at um, registry data, but unfortunately, I don't see anybody who will perform this trial. And this is a real pity. And I, this is, I really would like to use this option really to stimulate people and, and think about uh, doing such a randomized clinical trial. It's a great uh, need. And um, unfortunately, the companies won't support it, but uh, hopefully 
some uh, governmental funding will be available. And I think this trial should be done. Thank you. Dr. Akko, and okay, your comment? Yes, uh, one good thing was that it was done with rivaroxaban, which is a uh, once dose, uh, once a day uh, dosing. So I, I would say that probably, uh, so my assumption is that maybe uh, twice a day uh, dosing uh, drug will be much safer than rivaroxaban, mm -hmm. uh, which is one day alone. You know. So okay. I don't, I don't know. That's a, that's a only an assumption. But uh, what do you say, uh, Dr. Okay. Korn? <laughs> so I, I asked the other question to Dr. Yasuda. I just I, the, the the flip side of this question about you know does the DOAC matter? Is does the antiplatelet matter? And you know again we saw in um, uh, uh, a fire that I think uh, I think two thirds of the patients or three quarters got uh, the uh, got. A uh, aspirin, um, and only one quarter stayed on uh, a P2Y12. So, uh, anyone who wants to comment on that? Okay, is it yes. oh, Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Maybe Doctor Yasuda can answer this uh, specific question, but that's my <laughs> sub sub analysis. So that's why I, I'm answering it. Uh, uh, I published a paper in the Heart. Uh, showing that there's uh, no uh, significant differences between aspirin uh, versus the clopidogrel in the AFIA trial. So uh, maybe uh, we can use e either one. If, okay. we, if you had to uh, you know, combine the therapy. Okay, Dr. Yasta, comment? Yeah. yeah, I would like to say that uh, AFIA is a study for uh, CCS patients. And in the CCS, uh, thrombotic risk uh, is not high. Therefore, we should focus on bleeding risk. The AFIA trial, uh, we use the Japanese dose, a 50 milligram dose. That means uh, that the setting of dose may contribute to the uh, decrease the bleeding in the Japanese patients. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. I would like to emphasize. Okay. I think it's really time over. Today, I, I heard some very, you know, some challenging question from the, our young generation faculty. And uh, I, I, I heard that nowadays there is some new concept of, uh, is, you know, some strategy, real world strategy for after drug learning stenting. And the, usually we require at least uh, uh, six or three months depth therapy, but sometimes a patient requiring urgent surgery, something like some that. And she uh, suggests the proposal, something like, uh, you know, Dr. Yasuda showing the anticoagulation is the NOAC also effect, effect the 10A driven platelet activation, uh, you know, inhibitor. So, and she suggests uh, uh, some as a bridging therapy to stop the depth and then use NOAC. And then before surgery, two days, uh, ago before and stop the NUAC therapy. So uh, when, when I heard, oh, you are some smart, but looks like some crazy, something like that. Do, do you, how, how do you think that there is absolutely no trial? It's just uh, Yasuda is, do you, how do you think? Young generation. <laughs> the, uh, most of the young generation just doesn't know the trials that we did 20 years ago that you know showed some of those things were you know, didn't work so well. So I yeah. very early, you need antiplatelet therapy. I mean, you can't, I mean, that's, you know, we, that's, that was the STARS trial <laughs> just done 25 years ago. The, uh, um, we just have to, uh, we have to teach them more history. Okay. Okay. I think the time is already over and that uh, this uh, one and a half uh, hour session is very, very educational and, uh, you know, interactive discussion. So finally, I would like to ask a closing remark and uh, uh, Debbie Cohen for this session. The, uh, thank you, uh, uh, DW. It was a great session. It was wonderful to have so many of the investigators of very important trials in this field uh, to uh, uh, present their results and to give us some additional insight. Uh, clearly, this is a you know continues to be a challenging uh, 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 area. Um, I think there's you know many questions left to be answered uh, as we've uh, outlined many issues about differences across different geographies, something we've been talking about at TCT Asia Pacific for at least 15 years, I think. Uh, KW, I think, has been there for every single one of those uh, uh, talks, as I, as I recall, uh, uh, for it. And so I think we, you know, we probably 
have better data in Asia at this point than we do in the West. And we need more data coming out of the West so we know, you know for sure that we can generalize. Um, uh, so you guys are actually in a, a much better position than we are. Um, again, it's a really wonderful session, great panelists, great discussion. And I'm hoping that I will see so many of you uh, here in the US, uh, maybe this fall at TCT or the American Heart Association. And next year, with God willing, uh, in, uh, in Seoul for TCT Asia Pacific. Thank you. 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 Thank you joining Dr. Shubke. Thank you, Devi. Doctor, thank you for Dr. Thank Yasuda. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone. Take care. Have a good day. Have a bye good bye. day. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.